thank you, Dr. Konapalli and Indian Science Congress organizers to include me in this program. So what I'll be speaking this afternoon is the uh, development of the novel therapeutics to treat hemophilia. So my presentation is slightly different than the other presentations. It's a mostly review of the uh, literature and the field, where the field stands now, and what are the future perspectives. Uh, there are a couple of overlap slides between me and Dr. Konapali, uh, but they're important to set the stage. So as he said, hemostasis is a process which causes bleeding to stop. There are the three steps in the hemostasis. Whenever a, there is injury, uh, first step is the constriction of the blood vessel. So it narrows the lumen and reduces the blood flow. And second step is the formation of the plated plaque. And Dr. Nayak and Dr. Dash talked about the platelets, the activation. And the final step in hemostasis is the fibrin generation. Whenever the plated plug form, the clot is not very solid. And when the fibrin is generated and it forms like a fish network, and the, the clot is very solid, and that's what really is the thrombosis. So hemostasis is a very fine process, and it's very, very important. But sometimes it goes wrong. When I say it goes wrong, means it could have two options. Sometimes it clots abnormal, or it sometimes doesn't clot when it's supposed to clot. When it stops, when it clots unwantedly, and you may get the heart attack, or the stroke, or deep vein thrombosis. If this clot is formed in the carotid artery, it leads to heart attack. Coronary artery gives the stroke, and if it's in the clot in the veins, it leads to the deep vein thrombosis. And at the same time, blood doesn't clot when it's supposed to clot, and there's a bruise which is supposed to heal very easily, don't heal, and it's particularly a problem with the diabetics. It takes forever for the wounds to heal. And in some cases, the blood leaks into the joints and causes inflammation, and ultimately, it leads to the a joint disease and some, with a lot of pain, and sometimes you may have to uh, severe the limbs. And the bleeding disorders, is a royal disease because it was found in the uh, Queen Victoria family in England. And before 1900, uh, most of the people with the bleeding disorders are died at the young age, between the less than 10 years, and even they survived, and when they get this small accident, they often died. And in worldwide, there is a 300,000 hemophilia patients and in India, uh, we have about the 17,000 registered hemophilia patients. And as far as the Press Trust of India News Bulletin, only 15% of the patients are registered in India. And if you take that into the consideration, there's more than the 100,000 hemophilia patients in the India. And for treat this patient, it costs about the 10.3 billion and there's a 8% growth in the next five years. For you to understand the, exactly what is the bleeding disorders and how we treat, we have to know the coagulation cascade. And clotting is initiated by the uh, factor seven, which is present in plasma, binds to the uh, tissue factor, which is a receptor present on the cell surface. When tissue factor factor 7 form complex, 7 gets activated 7A, and tissue factor 7A activates the two proteins, one factor 10 to 10A, and 9 to 9A. 9A, in the presence of the factor 8A, it activates the, uh, again, 10 to 10A, and 10A activates the prothrombin to thrombin, and thrombin cleaves the fibrinogen to fibrin to give a clot. So what is the hemophilia disease is the one, either factor eight or factor nine are missing. So that is the hemophilia disorder. When factor eight is missing hemophilia A, factor nine is missing the hemophilia B. The best treatment for the hemophilia disorders is the one, you give the factor which is missing. In case of hemophilia A, you give the factor eight. In case of hemophilia B, you give the factor nine. 
that is the, the best treatment. But sometimes there is the inhibitors, or that is the antibodies are developed for these clotty factors, so you can't give the, these proteins. So in the last 50 years, there is a, a tremendous development of this uh, treatment of hemophilia disease. As I told you, about 100 years back, most of the patients died some, with hemophilia disorders. And in the early 1950s to 1970s, a lot of hemophilia patients died because of AIDS. The reason is the one people used to give the plasma concentrates to treat this patient, and afterwards the HIV infection was very prevalent, and most of the hemophilia patients died with the AIDS. Luckily, with all the recent development, that is not a problem because there is a recombinant proteins. So the two major developments in hemophilia treatment. First is the availability of the purified recombinant concentrates free of the virus. And that help patients to treat them at home before the bleeding really becomes a major problem. And the second major development of the hemophilia treatment is the one, the availability of prophylaxis treatment. The prophylaxis treatment is the one, you give these factors before you actually disease develops. So if you do the treatment, then you prevent the lot of complication associated with the hemophilia disease. But still there are a lot of remaining challenges how you treat the hemophilia patient. The first thing is the one, when you're treating the hemophilia patient by prophylaxis, that means that you have to give the factor eight or factor nine every day or every alternate day. So that costs a lot of money in the approximately, in Indian currency, one crore for a year to treat a patient, not to develop these problems. And second problem is the one, most of these treatments was given intravenous injections. So it's very difficult for patients with hemophilia from childhood to until to death to get the injection every day is a major problem. So these are the main problems. How do we overcome these problems and improve the treatment of hemophilia is the ongoing focus of the many, many labs, including my own lab. One way to overcome this problem is the one, you make a clotting factors which could last much longer in the circulation. Normally, factor eight lasts about 12 hours, factor nine about 16 hours. But if you can make a clotting factors which last maybe day, two, or one week, then we don't have to inject them repeatedly. So it reduces the cost necessary to buy these clotting factors, and also it reduces the number of injections needed to prevent the disease. There are a number of ways you can do that one. Uh, one way is the one, you make a recombinant protein uh, conjugate with the polyethylene glycol. So what this conjugation does is the one, it reduces the clearance of these clotting factors, so clotting factor stays much longer in the circulation. Other way to do is the one, you make a recombinant protein, factor eight or nine, with the FC fusion protein, so that also increases the circulation of life. And there are other ways to do that one, that is making the very stable factor eight, or removing the non-human glycans, because most of these clotting factors were made in the animal cells. So animal cells has the different glycans and that so that it is cleared very fast. So if you can make the recombinant proteins in human cells, there's a less chance that they cleared as fast as it's supposed to be. And so that's what's happening last few years. There are a number of companies made this second generation of these recombinant proteins and they were listed in this slide and some of them were the polyethylene glycol fusion proteins and some are the uh, FC fusion proteins, and some of these recombinant proteins are already approved, or uh, some of them are in the clinical trial. So what is important is the one, now we don't have to give the factor eight or factor nine twice a week. Now we can give a factor eight or nine, maybe once in a week, or maybe once in a two weeks. So that allows them, the patient to administer them a lot better than the otherwise. And there's also other way to do is the one, instead of extending the half-life, we can make a recombinant factor 7A, which has the lot of higher activity. That's very, very important for the gene therapy. One of the problems with the gene therapy is, whenever people try to factor 9 gene therapy, the amount of factor 9 produced in the 
of retinoviral infection is the very, very less amount, which is not sufficient to do the hemostasis. What they found in a patient is in Italy, he has factor 9, which has the 9 times more active than the wild type factor 9. So recently, they used that factor 9 molecule to construct the adenoviral to express in, and then inject it to the either mice or the monkeys. So the importance for this is the one, the problem with gene therapy is the one, you have to give so much adenovirus, it gives side effects. But with the increased factor 9 activity, we can reduce the viral load, so it can be one day, it becomes the uh, applicable to treat the patients. As I said, is the one, you can treat about 70% of patients, giving the missing factors, but the 30% of patients develop antibodies. For those patients, you can't give the missing factors, and we have to come with the alternative therapies. One alternate therapy is the one, immune tolerance induction. That means the, you make the patient not to recognize the, not to make antibodies to disappear. So how you make antibodies to disappear is the one, you give the factor 8 or factor 9, such a high dose, such a frequency, so that they get T-cell exhaustion, so there'll be no more T-cells to recognize that as a foreign protein, so they don't make the antibodies. And that is a very long-run process. It takes months to years, and takes a lot of protein factors, and very, very expensive. Other way to do is the one, you suppress the immune system by giving the corticosteroid or CD4-20 antibodies to, so that the, if you give the, this factor 8 or 9, they don't make antibodies. And the more common method is the one making the bypass therapy. That means you bypass the factor 8 and 9 to make the thrombin. The two reagents which are commonly used in bypass therapy is the recombinant factor 7A and recombinant factor 7A activates the 10 to 10A directly, bypassing the use of 9A and 8A. Other one is the activated prothrombin complex concentrate. It has the prothrombin 9, 10, factor 7A that activates either 10 to 10A or prothrombin to thrombin. Factor 7A works by binding to the activated platelets and generating the sufficient 10A to activate the prothrombin to thrombin, which is fibrin, and this has been used last 10 years very, very effectively to treat the hemophilia patients. So one of the problems with factor 7A is even if it's very, very effective, it has very short half-life of the, about the three hours. That means the, if you want to treat a patient who comes to the clinic, you have to infuse factor 7A every six hours, every 12 hours. And it becomes very difficult to treat those patients and becomes very expensive. And particularly countries like India, you can't afford that kind of money to treat these patients. So there's a lot of research going on. Is there other ways we can use the bypass treatment? And there's very, very interesting developments are going on. And there's a lot of new reagents. And one is the, because you can treat hemophilia by two different ways. One is in enhancing the clotting. Other thing is the one, you reducing the inhibits of clotting. Both works. So there's a new compound in the clinical trials is the, called the AS9110, is a bispecific antibody. And there are other targets which you actually target the in switch off, that means that you concentrate the inhibiting the inhibitors, that is the antithrombin 3 and TFPI. And this is the example of the how AS910, a bispecific antibody works. The function of factor 8 in the body is the one to get your substrate enzyme together, that is the getting 9A and factor 10 together so that the 9A could activate the factor 10. But if you have a bispecific antibody, one arm binds factor 9, other arm 9A, other arm binds factor 10, this antibody gets those two together so that you can get the clotting going on, and that's how this antibody works. And other thing I said is the one, there is a, a antibodies or the inhibitors, for example, TAPI, shots of the tissue factor 7A activity, and the 
there's the antithrombin 3, which blocks the thrombin, and there's the anticoagulant system, EPCR protein C, which is the anticoagulant pathway. If you knock down any of these inhibitors, you can get the clotting. And in our lab, our focus is the knocking down the uh, anticoagulant EPCR receptor. So what we have done in this experiment is the one, we got the hemophilia mice, and we treated the hemophilia mice by giving the recombinant factor 7A. And if you look at this slide, it takes about the four milligram of recombinant factor 7A to treat this hemophilia mice. But the, under the same mice, if you can block the EPCR anticoagulant pathway by giving the EPCR blocking antibody, now just one milligram of factor 7A is sufficient to treat this disease. So there is a possibility that the, if you give these EPCR antibodies, we don't need that much factor 7A to treat the patients. And also this is similar approach is there by giving the APC antibodies. So in summary, the viral inactivation method and available to recommend technology virtually eliminated the risk of blood-borne infection in hemophilia treatment. That is very good. And also long-term treatment of the hemophilia patient by prophylax treatment improves their health and reduces the joint disease and there are a lot of new therapies are coming in the market and in research. One of these therapies may be very useful. And finally, the recent development of the CRISPR cas one day make it feasible to treat the disease permanently. Thank you very much for your attention.